Hey, sports fans. Are you in the market for Florida sports or just keeping up with the latest in the panhandle? Palm Tree Sports is a dedicated audio hub to all things sports in the Sunshine State. We cover current events, big news, heavily favored opinions all across the NFL, NBA, MLB, and so much more. So come check us out every Saturday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a down south education on Florida sports and athletics. It's hosted by yours truly, Corey Pujols, and it's powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. IE Sports Radio fans, it's your boy, the SoCal Saint, the host of the premier professional wrestling podcast online today, the IE Elite Wrestling Show. If you're a fan and have a passion for the world of professional wrestling, this is the show for you. I take you inside the ropes with all the athleticism, high-flying, and hard-hitting action, and then we take it backstage with all the backstage drama and backstabbing that goes on in the world of professional wrestling today. If something's going on in the world of professional wrestling, rest assured, the SoCal Saint knows what's going on, and he's going to let you know too. If you're a fan, check us out every Tuesday, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, only on IE Sports Radio. The IE Elite Wrestling Show, your direct feed for all this professional wrestling, on the only network that is your direct feed for all that is sports. Check us out. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Palm Tree Sports. My name is Corey Pujols, and as always, I'm your host, and is brought to you and powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Happy Saturday, everybody. I hope you guys are enjoying the weekend right now. I am very happy to have made it here. It was a very tough week, but here we are at the end, the part that we get to celebrate from all the work that we accomplished, everything that we had going on earlier is now put to rest, and we can now focus on enjoying our free time. Well, if you have the free time, guys, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are busy out there. I'm pretty busy usually on the weekends too, but you know what? Let's make the most of this, guys. So again, welcome to Palm Tree Sports. Uh, let's go ahead and start digging into some of the things that we have going on. So there's not a lot of meat and potatoes to get today, guys, but I do have a bunch of sides and appetizers and, and a bit of a dessert, actually. Dessert's going to come in the middle of the meal, so I hope you're geared for that uh, today. So we're, the first thing I want to talk about, though, is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. As you guys know, we always start in the NFL, so let's go ahead and get right to it. And with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, there was this interesting story going around Tampa for the last 48 to 72 hours, I believe it was. And get this, our uh, pro ball safety, Anton Winfield, seems to believe that Tampa Bay is still pursuing Tom Brady. It could be the nature of Brady's off off the field off season so far. For those of you who do not know, he's been enjoying his free time. He's been spending a lot of time with his children. He was on uh, the Mr. Beast episode uh, that he has on his channel. If you guys didn't check that out, it was actually a pretty cool one where they get to go on yachts and they get to experience the different versions of some of the biggest, most expensive yachts in the world. So if you haven't seen that video, go check it out. It was actually pretty cool uh, to see all of those guys. It wasn't just Tom. There were other people there, but you know, Tom was kind of the the goat in the conversation, <laughs> to say the least. So, guys, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. But there's also the all-white party that he went to recently, which he was seen uh, having fun with Kim Kardashian. So I'm not going to put too much into that, but let's just say this. It is possible that he could decide to come back again. Now, I don't believe that he will, but I'm just putting that out there because, obviously, this story made some news, and I know that people are going to ask about opinions. I think he should stay retired. Just out of my love for him, I want him to be happy. I don't want him to have to experience uh, more of what the last two years was, which was success with a lot of injuries, a lot of strings attached, a lot of things for him to consider, especially during the offseason. Also, the fact that his kids are, you know, they're only getting older. They're not getting any younger. And I imagine he wants to be everywhere he can possibly be inside of his children's life. So I just, I want him to be happy. And in order for him to be happy, I feel like he... Brian needs to go ahead and stay retired for now. That's just my humble opinion on the situation, although I will say this, how great it would be to see the GOAT in Creamsicle. 
which is what leads us to our second detail segment of Tampa Bay, which is the fact that we got our creamsicles reimagined, redesigned, and re-released for us. So that is a very cool thing. You're already able to purchase uh, these jerseys on the website and at the, the team store. Obviously, you can get a custom-made Brady jersey. That's what I would get personally if I went back there but I could also see myself having a Mike Evans jersey due to the fact that Mike has actually worn the throwback jersey once before in his career if I remember correctly and uh, needless to say it's a jersey that really catches you like you don't think much about it when you see it or when you hear about it but when you actually see the game being played you're like whoa those are Tampa Bay's old uniforms though that's crazy because you know when you think Tampa Bay a lot of people think the pewter and red right so yes it's nice that we have these jerseys. I was a big fan of the pewter and red, personally, in my you know, experience. I think that is the best jersey for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It presents the best look. It kind of brings the dog out of us here in the South. And it's one of those things that I believe is a hallmark. You know, the jerseys that we had before with those those ugly shoulder colors. And the, the, the only cool thing about that one was the design of the pirate ship. So having the ability to go back in time, almost like time traveling, and experience the creamsicle jerseys again is kind of a heaven sent for us. Uh, it's the jersey that we started with as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan. I can tell you this right now. Some of the all-time Tampa greats wore that jersey before we got the pewter and red. So just take that into consideration, guys, that there's a lot of history behind that jersey. It also signifies the time that the team made the playoffs for the first time, which was a huge deal, especially coming off of Owen in, uh, what was that, Owen 19 was it 0-16, 0-19? One of those team uh, sport... Um, <clears throat> my apologies, guys. Starting off 0-16 at the beginning of our franchise's career. So I was trying to get the proper wording there, but it, we sucked for a long time, guys. For a very, very long time, we sucked. And that was one of the things that was attached to it was the jersey, all right? So in any case, I look forward to seeing these jerseys uh, back on the playing field. I can't wait to see what the team looks like as a whole, you know, all the different players with all their different numbers, Mike, uh, Chris, you know, all those guys, Levante, we got a little bit of a photo op, but we want to see it in motion, like, let's just be honest, guys, I want to see it in motion, I look forward to being able to get a, a Brady creamsicle jersey, that's just my take on it again, that's what I was hoping for, I was really wishing that we would get to see him in one, but hey, we can still get it made, it's not far-fetched, uh, so, you know, look forward to that, guys. And once I get it, I'll be uploading the picture so y'all can see it. Uh, so that's what's going on in Tampa Bay. Let's go ahead and move on over to the Jaguars. The Jaguars have some similar drama going on, as, but theirs is with players. Same thing with the, the Finns, actually. So we'll get into that in a minute. But with the Jaguars, the focus has been on Evan Ingram, who is still expected to show up for training camp, even though the, the contract negotiations, ha negotiations haven't gone anywhere. So for those of you who do not know, Evan Ingram played his tail off last year for the Jaguars under a one-year contract. Or not a one-year contract, but a, a, a tight end based salary kind of contract and he's looking for some money and he deserves it he was one of the reasons why uh they were able to be so successful he helped revitalize a dead receiving core at the time before last year when they signed christian kirk and all those other players in the offseason of course calvin really was out due to the gambling issue which i just think was the dumbest thing ever but you know hey that's just my opinion i'm not going to go into politics guys but i think it was stupid i think the league was childish for doing that to him i don't really see necessarily why there's a problem there uh except for if you're throwing the game but as a receiver it's gonna be hard for you to throw the game like let's just be honest guys you know if a quarterback throws a game or if a coordinator or our coach throws a game that's one thing but I don't see Calvin really doing that he was a dog in Atlanta he's still a dog now and that just makes Evan Ingram's case that much more important because you want to you know provide continuity to your quarterback and the best way you can do this by keeping the people who helped him succeed Evan Ingram being chief among them in that list so I really hope that they are able to come down pay the man he deserves it I know you guys spent a lot of money in the offseason but you also made a lot of money so hopefully you guys can figure out something even if it's just an extension of, of some sort you know something just to to let him know hey listen he's valued here we want to make sure he's taken care of that he doesn't need to go somewhere else to kind of find to find the money that you guys should be paying him uh Jags so and then also for Trevor Lawrence's continuity, again, as I mentioned, uh, Evan Ingram was a big target for him last year. He was able to be relatively successful with the help that he had, and we saw what type of moves they were able to make, especially with such a young quarterback. So that goes to show that Trevor Lawrence has it, and also that this team can produce. Uh, is that a request for Santa? Yeah, <laughs> you could say that is a request to Santa. Uh, you know, to have that that Brady cream I mean, think about it like this. Your favorite player ever on your favorite team ever 
with the original jersey. You know, that's just something that you can't really beat, just tagging that on there. And, you know, I agree with you there that he should stay uh, retired. You know, it's just it's for his happiness and for him to enjoy the rest of his life right now. But, you know, I, I, I agree with both of those there. So, but with the Jags, as we were talking about before, you know, that's really what's going on there as far as the contract negotiation. There's not really any other standout issues for the Jaguars, but there has been this recent development. So, guys, this is just some food for thought for you guys. Pretty early on in the segment, we normally hold that towards the, the latter end, especially when we get closer to what to look out for for this weekend. But here's an interesting question that seems to be circling around the league. I saw it on Twitter and Instagram, and obviously you have a lot of people who are going to have a huge opinion on this. But the question was, is Fred Taylor a Hall of Fame running back? Now, guys, that is an excellent question. For those of you who do not know, Fred Taylor is, if I remember correctly, the all-time leading rusher in Jaguars history, and he was also the first pro ball uh, r- running back that the Jaguars had from out of their franchise. He went to the University of Florida. He was a tremendous running back at the University of Florida. We used to call it Taylor Made whenever he scored a touchdown, and that was where that term kind of caught fire with the Jaguars. And as you guys know, he was an outstanding running back in, if I remember correctly, the late 90s, early 2000s, and really stood out apart. He was consistently a top 10 running back at times, a top 5 running back at any given uh, on any given Sunday, hence the movie, guys. And as a Gator fan, I can tell you that he was one of those guys where, like, you saw him on Saturday and you're like, oh, he's going to be terrific on Sunday. Like, you, when if you watch college football, you watch NFL football, those are those, there are those guys that you watch and you're just like, oh my goodness, whoever gets this guy is going to be special. I'll give you a few examples. Saquon Barkley, just from the running back position, Saquon Barkley, Adrian Peterson, Reggie Bush, these were all guys that, like, you watched them on Saturday and you said to yourself, oh my goodness, on Sunday... This guy's going to be an absolute tear. So that was what happened with uh, with Fred Taylor. I believe that he is a Hall of Fame running back. I would absolutely put him in there, especially when you look at his body of work for a franchise that couldn't do much without him. He was on a team that he was pulling a good 50% of the touches and scoring that that team was responsible for. You also had players like Keith McCardell, and I, I believe uh, Bur- Burnell was the quarterback back then, guys. Uh, and that, that right there should tell you, you know, how good he was because that guy was not a top 10 quarterback during that during that time, guys. I mean, you, you're talking about young Peyton Manning, young Tom Brady. You're talking about um, Kurt Warner. You're talking about all these different quarterbacks who were just, they were just out there slinging it. Right, like, let's just call it like what it is. They're out there swinging in a in a, a time where running backs weren't necessarily playing second fiddle to the wide receivers, but it was important to have great wide receivers at that time. Okay, and that was an example of a running back elevating his team beyond what they were originally or on paper capable of. <clears throat> Excuse me, my apologies, us. But that is that is basically my opinion there on Fred Taylor's tremendous running back. He is definitely um he is what you would call a franchise running back, somebody like Adrian Peterson and Saquon Barkley, who teams were able to build the rest of their team around and also make it to playoffs in a certain situation. Some of those teams just flat out made it to Super Bowls. Okay. So, you know, congratulations uh on the future Hall of Famer. In my humble opinion, Fred Taylor, I believe he will be in when it's all said and done. And also, when you look across the Jaguars and you think of a player, I don't know if there's any other player that comes to mind faster than Fred Taylor. All right, guys, it's just something for you to take into consideration. But I'm going to say congratulations now and and put that out into existence because I believe that he will be a Hall of Famer and he absolutely deserves it. Uh, So, yeah, there's that. Now, let's go ahead and move on over to the Finns. There's a bit of information that's pretty interesting coming out of Miami. Okay, so check this out. All right, check this out. Tariq Hill says he will break the 2,000-yard receiving mark and the Finns will win a Super Bowl. I just have one problem with that, guys. I just have one problem with that. Okay? I love the statement. I love the energy. I do. I love the passion behind him coming out and saying, we're going to be a force. I'm going to be a force. I'm going to help elevate this team. You know, yada, yada, yada. That's that's beautiful, Tariq. That's just beautiful, okay? I, I just got one problem. Can you protect your quarterback first? All right, and I'm going to wear this out, guys. I'm going to wear this out probably well into the season because I do not like when I see somebody who is less cared for than, you know, a bystander or, or, or a coaching staff member. You see what I'm saying? Like, this guy, 
had, what was it, two concussions in a matter of, what was it, nine days, eight, eight nine days or something like that. It's absolutely horrific. This is just almost unheard of, okay, from a quarterback's perspective. Yeah, you go out there, you see a receiver, he gets knocked around a little bit, he thinks he's okay, comes back, gets rocked again. Now you're sitting there like, oh, he's going to need to take some time. This is your quarterback. This is your franchise cornerstone. Okay, guys? And, yeah, sure. When he's healthy, y'all are top five. Maybe top three. Maybe. Possibly. But that's when he's healthy, which has been pretty much a 50-50 ball game. You know, a 1-1 ball game headed into the ninth. Who's going to take it home? I don't know. It was 1-1. It's been pretty, you know, defensive ball game. So, guys, I would love to see Miami do nothing more than rock the shoes of the AFC East and just dominate that division. That would be great. It just makes Florida look that much better. Florida sports look that much better. It gives me something better to talk about. But, guys, I, I, I don't see it. Like, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I do not see Tariq. First things first. First, let me let me address this, okay? Tariq Hill had a phenomenal season year that the that they played the Bucks in the Super Bowl. When they played the Bucks in the Super Bowl, the guy had, was it, one catch? All right? Two catches or something like that. One or two catches. He, he was basically completely smothered. All right? We play good defense down here. All right? And that was one of the things that we did. But we're not the only team that can play good defense. And that game will show you exactly how to bottle up Tariq Hill, and it's called too deep. All right? It's not a hard <laughs> it's not a hard thing to do. But the two deep safety look, basically just telling both of your guys, hey, listen, just stay back here. If it's if it's anything beyond twenty, double. Alright, just double up. One guy will go one way or two guys slide this way, whatever the case may be. We showed that defense is typical Tampa two. Alright? Typical Tampa two. Two deep, man on the outsides, linebackers gonna be flying around, defensive linemen gonna be flying around. It's just what we do. Alright? Any team can emulate that as long as they have the athletes necessary. All right? It's not a hard thing to do. It's, it's, it's not, guys. So when you look at that, I say, Tariq, I, like I said, I love the energy. I love the strength. I don't, I don't think so, though. You guys have better or issues to cook or more important issues to cook, all right, such as keeping your quarterback healthy and upright, signing Dalvin Cook, which you guys have not been able to do yet, which is the second thing that I want to talk about here, and because of that issue, I think to myself, like, okay, look, if you guys sign Dal- Dalvin Cook, yeah, you're going over 2,000 yards because the play action is going to be there all day, okay? If you don't sign Dalvin Cook, guess what? I'm going to stick one linebacker in the hole, and I'm going to say, look, if he beats you, he beats you, all right? Because what you're not going to do is just go 80 every every freaking play. 80 yards to Tariq Hill, 80 yards to Tariq Hill, 75, 60, what? No, we're not doing that, okay? And I'm pretty sure these are what the defensive coordinators of other teams, especially in AFC East, are thinking about. Here's the second nine of this ball game. The other teams that are interested in signing Dalvin Cook are the Patriots and the Jets. I ask you this question, guys. If either the Patriots or the Jets sign Dalvin Cook, does that make them much more of a threat to win the division than Miami? Because Miami, like I said, you can be good with all the running gun firepower that you have, but guys, at some point, you still got to run. That's the point of the running gun. You have to have a good running back. Uh, Here's an example. For those of you who remember the greatest show on turf, those... Uh, at the time, it was the St. Louis Rams, all right? And they had Kurt Warner, they had Isaac Roof, they had Torrey Hall, and they had Marshall Falk. The reason why it worked out is because you had Marshall Falk. You might think that Kurt Warner was the centerpiece to it all, but as long as you could have put, you could have probably put, um, at the time, what was the quarterback for the Chiefs? Trent, Trent something. And you could probably could have put him in the quarterback position and it would have worked out just fine. You could have put old behind Troy Aikman in that position and worked out just fine because he won three Super Bowls doing that exact same thing, okay, with, with Michael Irvin and, and uh, Emmitt Smith, Gator. But still, you get what I'm saying. So, Marshall Falk was the reason why that, that team made it to back-to-back Super Bowls. He was the centerpiece because of what he was able to do out of the backfield one, providing a third receiving option that was better than reliable to being able to help protect the quarterback in pinch situations while Kurt Warner slinging this ball downfield. And then four, when he does touch the ball, he's a human highlight reel. And if you guys don't believe me, if you're too young, go look at Marshall Falk highlights. I'm telling you right now, it's going to be some of the best highlights you've ever seen. You're going to see ankles get snapped. Okay, the man was an absolute treasure at running back position, and because of that, his team was able to run a gun so effectively they made it to two Super Bowls, recording some of the best uh, offensive highlights that you will ever see in the history of football. Okay, especially by just one team. Just you, just think it to yourself: this one team is just that good. They're just that unstoppable. Wow. You know, and albeit it was the defense that helped them win that Super Bowl, but you got to have some offense. You got to put some points on the board somehow. All right. So uh, we'll see what happens there with. The Finns, I just, they, they have to sign Dalvin Cook. They have to. Because 
it's going to be hard to be a high flying offense without a high flying running back, guys. That's all I'm saying. And like I said, history. I just I just gave you two examples with the Cowboys. I don't even like the Cowboys, but the Cowboys and the Rams who were able to do it. The Cowboys won three out of four Super Bowls when they did it. And like I said, the Rams went back to back, and it would have been two in a row. Unfortunately, they ran into Tom Brady, and Tom's the goat. So, and and. Good job, Tom, because, you know, we all saw what he did there against the Rams. In any case, guys, that's what's going on here in the NFL. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our first break of the evening. When I get back, I have a little dessert for you in the middle of the show. We're going to talk about uh, NCAA rankings as far as recruiting is concerned here in college football. We're going to slide on down to the NBA for a little bit of information that has been popping out there. Caught my eye. We're going to slide over to the MLB, discuss what's going on with the Rays and what to expect for them coming out of the All-Star break. After that, we have AEW's Collision, which is coming on tonight, and also UFC Fight Night. We're going to get into all that in a few more minutes, guys, so keep it locked here on Palm Tree Sports Radio. My name is Corey Pujols, your host, and as always, it is brought to you and powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. What's happening, sports fans? Are you a fan of Southern California sports? Are you looking for a show hotter than a hot summer day in California? Then look no further than the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, where I talk about all things Southern California sports. That's right, all sports teams from Southern California. From the hard-hitting tackles of the NFL, to the killer crossovers and big three-pointers of the NBA and WNBA, to the grand slams of the MLB, to the bone-chilling goals of the NHL, and to the booming kicks of the MLS, the SoCal Supreme Sports Show has it all for you. Oh, and let us not forget about the college sports as well. So join me, Taryn Rodriguez, every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Are you a fan of Buffalo sports? Are you thinking of changing loyalties and becoming a Buffalo sports fan? Do you even know where Buffalo is on the map? Did you know Canada is closer to Buffalo than New York City? Welcome to the Buffalo Huddle every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 4 p.m. Pacific Coast Time on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Patty Bax. This is a podcast designed for you, the passionate sports fan. I know you love your sports. Who doesn't? I cover Buffalo sports and so much more by bringing in the human elements. I call it Buffalo sports with a twist. Join me as we take a journey into the world of Buffalo sports. I guarantee you'll fall in love with Buffalo just like I did. Each week, we start with an inspiration, question of the day, a Buffalo fun fact, and a weekly challenge to you, the listener. Come huddle up with me every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 4 p.m. Pacific Coast Time for the Buffalo Huddle with Patty Bax on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. As we say in Buffalo, Go Bills! Alrighty, you guys, welcome back to Palm Tree Sports. Again, my name is Corey Pujols, your host. And as always, it is brought to you and powered by IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Guys, we just covered the NFL. Let's go ahead and, decide, like I said, slide into some dessert here in college football with some rankings. Uh, last week, I mentioned to you guys that the recruiting process was starting to get into full swing. Coaches are starting to open up and really show what they're made of here and be able to recruit proper, properly. 
And that is a big deal because for those of you who watch college football, this is one of the things that separate college from the NFL and what makes it so exciting is that the recruiting process takes place across over 150 teams, guys. That is a lot. All right. That's a lot of football. For reference, the NFL only has 32. Take that in consideration, guys. You have 150 plus teams all pitching to different three, four, five star recruits across the country, selling them their brand, telling them what they, they can do. And it's very interesting because there's a bargain here. See, a lot of people think that you just go where you like, right? Well, get this. There are a lot of kids who play football but don't have a team that they love or that comes first to them in their mind. Let me give you an example. I played football in middle school, and had I continued on, had I been, you know, gotten a little bit bigger, a little bit taller, perhaps I definitely would have been, I not perhaps, I would have definitely been on somebody's college football radar. Where? I'm not sure. I had a lot of talent, guys. I'm not making this up. Very talented at the game of football. But, again, like I said, my height and weight was something that was, was hard to overlook. I walk around at 120 to 130. I stay between 120 and 130, and there's no jogging it. Like, I can't break 135 to save my life. Okay, guys, I can't. <laughs> and it's okay. It's, it's a funny thing. But that's just something to take into consideration because you have guys who – they're in the league, and yeah, they might be, you know, the 5'8 area, but they are just massive, you know, for their 5'8 frame. They're able to put on that kind of weight. These are examples of some of the best recruits that are coming out of the the high school areas that they're being recruited, which is primarily where, guys, let's be honest, California, Texas, Florida, those are the three biggest. You got Georgia, who's up there in the mix. You got some players who play very well from up north. You have Philadelphia, New York area, of course. There's been a lot of talent to come out of the Midwest as well, even Tornado Alley. And guys, the point that I'm making behind this is recruiting reflects the coach's ability to sell, okay? That is absolutely massive because if a coach can come out and say, hey, listen, I can get you to the league. The player is going to pay attention because the ultimate goal is to get to the league, to become a draft pick, to be number one overall draft pick. But in order to get there, you have to get notoriety. You have to get coached up properly. You have to have the right environment for you. The environment is going to change based off what you like. I'm going to give you another example. In the SEC, we're all about speed and defense. Okay, Offense goes without saying. You got to have offense no matter where you go. But the primary driving force behind the teams that are good in the SEC are the fact that inside the SEC, we have shootouts every week. So when it's time to go play a ball game against the best side of the Pac-10 or the Big 12 or whatever, you see what I'm saying? We have fought against other gladiator-esque type teams in our own conference already. There's nothing that you're going to throw at us that we haven't seen before. And that's why you have teams like Alabama, like Georgia, like LSU, who just go on tears on a regular basis in college football. Then we're all saying, oh, you know, just they're just doing that. Alabama's just doing that Alabama thing. Georgia's just doing that Georgia thing. You know, LSU's just doing that LSU thing that they do. And LSU is on fire. All right. They, 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 the volcano. All right, guys. They are ridiculous on what they're able to do across all the major sports and then some. Of course, they went out and knocked my Gators off in the college uh, World Series unfortunately with that and then as you know a few years ago you had Joey Burr you guys know I love JB uh I can't help it I I am a fan of that guy through him playing the Gators consistently Uh, they are eternal rivals so you have to take into consideration JB's worst game in college was against who guys that's right the Florida Gators so you know, I got a ton of respect for that dude. The guy's an absolute amazing competitor. He's somebody that I learned to to love a lot more than, uh, I guess you could say, despise. You know, especially seeing him, you know, twice in his college football career. So, with that being said, let's talk about these recruiting uh, rankings right now. Because that's essentially what they are. Obviously, nothing is set in stone. Teams can still flip. But we're going based off of commits right now. And if we're going based off of commits, we're going to go ahead and start with the Florida Gators. The Florida Gators are currently ranked 13th in the nation, which is huge. All right, guys, for those of you who do not know, Florida's recruiting has been abysmal since Urban Meyer. Uh, shortly after Urban Meyer is when it started to go down, uh, Will Muschamp was our coach. After that, he was our defensive coordinator under Urban Meyer. He was promoted to head coach. He was barely ha- able to hang on to the four and five star recruits that he had during the time of taking over from Urban Meyer, but from that point on, just continued to go downhill. After that, I believe it was Jim McElwain. Jim McElwain had the shortest 15 seconds of fame in the recruiting limelight, and then after that, we didn't see top 10 again until 
we're pretty much now uh, giving us a few more options at recruiting as far as the four stars are concerned. We don't have any five stars, but let me go ahead and give you the sit rep, okay? So again, we're ranked 13th in the nation with 22 commits. We have zero five-star prospects. However, watch this, 18 four-star prospects and four three-star prospects. Guys, that's a big deal because we've been floating for the better part of the last 10 years. We have been floating at that three-star recruiting mark. I mean, you know, every now and again, we get a couple of four stars, maybe a five star once in a while, you know, like Anthony Richardson and, you know, some of these other ball players. But those guys, they're here because they want to play here, just like I would be. You know what I'm saying? If I'm playing in high school football and somebody asked me and said, hey, listen, where do you want to play college football? I'm the University of Florida. Do you have any other options? I mean, sure, but uh, I really just want to go to University of Florida. If they offer, I'm going to take it. I don't really care what the offer is. It could be for a dollar and I'm taking it because I love the University of Florida. That is my home from a college perspective. OK, now. If I hadn't been, you know, there's a team up north, you know, Penn State that I would have loved to play for as well. You know, I love Penn State, the Nittany Lions. Shout out Nittany. Uh, LSU, even though they were eternal rivals to the Gators, hey, at least I'd be in a Ben Hill Griffin Stadium once a year. And also LSU, guys. I mean, come on. The Tigers. That, that purple and, 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 and uh, the purple and yellow, like the guys, it's just an absolutely magnificent college. And that's just one of the other ones there. And then, of course, there's Clemson. I've always been impartial to Clemson. I'm not a big Knowles fan. I have respect for the Knowles. But if I had to choose, I'm not I'm not playing for the rival. I'm going to play for the rival's rival. <laughs> so uh, go Clemson. But so, yeah, there's an idea. And I'm pretty sure that's how other high school prospects think when they have the opportunity to play college ball. So. I'm very ecstatic to hear that 18 four-star recruits, guys, that volume is absolutely phenomenal, okay? There are other teams having a hard time keeping up with that type of volume. If we can get one or two five-star recruits by the time that the summer is over, I will have called this our best recruiting class in the last 10 years, and I can't wait to see what we're able to do with Billy Napier, who is an excellent salesman. He's been showing that, and hopefully, like I said, this 22 commits will turn into about 30, 35, and you know, we'll get a couple of five stars in there. If we can do that, like I said, I'll call that successful in every shape and form. And I look forward to being able to see what these recruits are able to do for us, uh, especially since a lot of them are on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, Florida's, we're, we're known for playing defense, except for against Georgia, it seems. And I'm not going to dig on my Gators. I'm not going to dig on my Gators. I'm, we're going to talk about that another time, okay? So, moving on to the Knowles. The Knowles, all right, this is weird, all right, guys? So, for all the Knowles fans out there, you guys are in a weird situation. You have the best team in Florida right now, all right? On paper, on the field, you guys have the best team out of all the Florida teams in college football. And as a result, I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing. I'm going to go on the side of bad. But you guys are actually the lowest ranked team of the big three here in Florida. All right, I don't know what's going on in FSU. Maybe y'all are happy with all the sophomores and juniors that check out a very young team, a team that's only going to get better next year, I believe. But you guys are ranked 19th with only 19 commits, all right? And I'm saying only because, like I said, if you're the best team in Florida, you would think, why doesn't everybody just go play for FSU? Well, everybody has their preference, right? So, at uh, ranked at 19th with 19 commits, you guys have one five-star recruit, you have eight four-star recruits, and nine three-star recruits. So, this is an interesting ratio just due to the fact that, like, in the four- and five-star area, you guys are sitting at dead even with your three-star recruits. What does that mean for the uh, uh, Florida State University? Essentially, it just means that you guys have a lot of starters in key places and that you guys are trying to show up other locations that need that kind of work. And that is the reason why I believe that yours is almost split down the middle between the blue chip recruits and then three star and then so on and so on. Obviously, we're not counting two star, one star recruits because these guys can still be developed in time and they can develop past what they are ranked at right now. Some players mature faster, some players mature sooner, some you know, uh, mature much later in their careers, and then some require the experience enough to be able to mature. So that's something that we'll have to wait and see what happens there. And then we're going to go ahead down to Miami. Okay. Miami's probably the worst team, okay, in the big three of Florida's college football teams. However, they are the highest ranked <laughs> in the recruiting pool. So isn't that ironic? All right. So let me run that by you one more time. The best team on paper right now out of the big three is Florida State. The worst team on paper right now, okay, are the Miami Hurricanes. But Miami has the best recruiting, the highest ranked recruiting class so far out of the state of Florida 
out of the big three. And that's just such a, a tongue-twisting, confusion-based area there that's just got me all wrapped up. Why is that? Well, I'm going to tell you. Miami has two five-star recruits, okay? I'm What? How? These guys must have wanted to play for Miami. That's my logic. Or they believe in the coaching staff. You know, there's one or two things here. Now, it's hard-pressed for me to believe that if you're getting an offer from Miami, that you're not getting an offer from Florida State, from Clemson, from Duke University, from some of these other teams that have found more success in the, in the past. It just leads me to believe that they want to sign with Miami because that's where the their home is from the Hearts perspective, right? Again, mine would be for Flor- University of Florida. I'm a Gator. I bleed blue and orange. So I imagine these guys most likely bleed orange and green. Hey, more power to you, Miami. Good job with your uh, five-star recruits. Uh, Miami is ranked 7th. I don't know if I got that out there. They're ranked 7th nationally with 26 commits. Uh, Like I said, two five-star recruits, which is huge. 14 four-star recruits, also huge. And then eight three-star recruits. Again, these blue chip recruits turning out to be 16 to 8 on the three-star, which is an exactly 2 to 1 ratio. Guys, 8 plus 8 is 16, all right? So they are outdoing their three-star recruits with their blue with their blue chip recruits by a 2 to 1 ratio. That ratio is phenomenal. Let's just call it like what it is. But as we've seen in Miami, it's not the talent that's the problem. It's been the coaching. It has been the coaching for almost the last 20 years, guys. All right? I'm somebody who's watched a ton of college football. I've been watching college football since I was 4 or 5 years old. One of the first games I ever saw was the Gators just beating the crap out of Peyton Manning. And let me tell you this, that did not go to show how good Peyton Manning would become. Peyton became a top five quarterback. He couldn't beat Florida. Think about that, guys. He's a top five quarterback all the time in the NFL, but he couldn't beat Florida. Not one time. He played four years and he lost all four times. Think about that, guys. Just just think about that for, for you know perspective. So Miami can have the best recruiting and all they want, but until they're able to make use of those players, especially the blue chip players, not going to really matter. All right, not going to really matter, especially when, like I said, when they got to play FSU, they got to play Clemson, they got to play Duke, they got to play a lot of teams who are just going to figure it out with what they have, and they have been, you know, this entire time. So guys, that's what's going on in the recruiting aspect. Uh, in order, it would go like I said: Miami Gators, Knowles, as far as the recruiting is concerned. However, the Gators do not have a single five-star recruit. So hopefully, once uh, if and once that does happen, I'll be able to report to you that good news. Uh, depending on what happens this week, will determine who is one, two, and three. Uh, UCF was also pretty high in the recruiting polls. I believe they were top twenty. I think it was uh, sitting at like nineteen or eighteen or something like that nationally. So. Uh, shout out to UC, uh, 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 my bad UCF as well for being able to land some good recruits. And we'll, like I said, we'll see what happens as this summer continues to roll on. We get more information. <clears throat> Excuse me. My apologies, guys. Now, let's go ahead and move on over to the NBA. The NBA has a little bit of information from the Heat and the Magic. This is more rumor than fact, unfortunately, as we are still waiting for deals to get done. But for the Heat, as you guys may know, they have been pursuing Damian Lillard. It has been to yet at this point no avail. However, reports have them close to a trade. All right. The trade is surrounded by Tyler Hero. All right. Odds are it's going to be Tyler Hero, a couple of first round draft picks, maybe two first and two second. I'm not exactly sure. There's a lot of ammunition okay to be used to get Damian Lillard but they they will need it unfortunately Damian Lillard is one of the premier PGs in the league the guy is absolutely phenomenal at what he does and his ability to score is unparalleled I mean especially in range the only other person I feel like that has the range that he has on a regular shooting basis if I take LeBron out of the mix is going to be Steph Curry of course Steph Curry is the greatest sniper of all time but Damian Lillard is doing a good job you know, with his ranged ball game, and that's what's been able to separate him from a lot of the other players in the league who like to crowd the paint area. You know, they like to go inside and utilize nifty moves and, and, you know, handles and everything. Yeah, Dame has that too. That's great, but a lot of these players don't have range, and he has it. He's one of those guys at range. I assume this pick is an idea to go small to beat the Joker, but unfortunately, I think you have to go big to beat Joker, and... I just don't know if this move is going to be enough that if they were to get back to the finals again, that they would be able to beat the Nuggets. Because again, the Nuggets, as long as they retain all their pieces, are going to be the favorite to win it next year, uh, barring something happen to Joker or Jamal Murray. It's that simple, right? So we'll see what happens, guys. I I hope that the Heat are able to get Damian Lillard, but I also hope they're able to get another center, at least one or two more centers, uh, that are able to just, if at the very least, get Joker into foul trouble. Because again, at the end of the day, the league next year is going to be very simple. Who can stop Joker? 
All right, who can stop Joker? If you can't stop Joker, you can kiss the finals goodbye. You don't even have, don't even worry about it. Like, don't you're not even gonna get there. Don't even worry about it. But the teams that are gonna be able to stack up against the Nuggets are gonna be the teams that are gonna make it. They're gonna dive deepest into the playoffs, and we'll see what happens. Uh, with Miami, or not Miami, my apologies. With the Magic, they are interested in Pasco Siakam, or are they? So here's the deal. The Magic are a very young team with not a lot of veteran leadership, all right? They've been building up the team through the draft over the last three years with a bunch of young guys. Some of these young guys have been panning out. Some of them have been not. The problem is there's no firepower, all right? We got a defense juggernaut and a, and a defensive rookie of the year base player from last year in Paolo, but unfortunately, he's going to need some help, and he doesn't have it. Siakam could be a very good centerpiece to help build a team around the guys already seen in finals. Uh... He's, he's a champion. He's already done pretty much all there is to do. He's had breakout games. He's had down in the dump games. The guy reminds me a lot of Kevin Love, a guy that can really get it done with a lot of experience now. And somebody still worth going out to grab simply because he's still young. He can still play. But, like I said, it just seems like this is all noise and no substance. It seems like more so that people are putting him here in the situation to believe that he would be the ideal fix. However, he's not in the mix. It's a weird thing. It's really kind of confusing, I guess you could say, but these are the kind of rumors that we experience here in the NBA, especially with teams like this, who could be, you know, a couple of good players away from talking about a playoff run. Now, I'm not saying that the Orlando Magic is one of those teams that have been one of the worst teams for the better part of a decade, but I'll say this. It doesn't take much to turn our team around, all right? It, it doesn't. And I say that because if you pay attention to a lot of these teams, the power, you know, the power five teams are more or less always the same. You know, Boston... Uh, the Nuggets are obviously kind of new there, but, you know, since the addition of Jamal Murray, Jokic has only gotten better, and they've been in that mix at least for the last few years. Uh, Miami's been in that mix. Um, Cleveland is also new on the east side as far as, you know, new teams there. But Boston, Milwaukee, Golden State, your typicals. You know what I'm saying? Teams that you expect to see and do well. Uh, Dallas. These are all teams that have been Power 5 teams for the for the longest. The Lakers are up and down in that 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 conversation. And when you think about that, you ask yourself, you know, does Orlando have the opportunity to do that? Yes, they're going to need some help though. Like I said, they're going to need a lot, a lot of help. So we'll see what Orlando is able to do. They need to do some type of cooking because they haven't been, all right? They haven't done much of anything outside of the draft. So we'll look to see what happens. Hope the best for the Magic. Heat, sign Damien, get bigger inside, and then, you know, let's return to the finals and see what happens there. I mean, that's, that's the only, you know, advice and logic I have for the Heat, unfortunately. Anyway, guys, let's go ahead and take one more break, and when we get back, we'll get ready to wrap this show up with what's going on with the Rays, with AEW tonight, and the UFC tonight as well. Like I said, there's going to be a lot to, uh, a lot to watch and keep an eye out for tonight. Like I said, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, you know, as always, my name is Corey Pujols, your host for Palm Tree Sports Radio, brought to you by IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. What up, Boston sports fans? This is Mikey Two Guns here, your host of Our Bleepin' City, airing every Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m., Right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Please join me. We'll talk everything Boston sports, all the local teams, college teams. I'm even down to talk MMA, boxing, whatever you guys want. So join me every Wednesday night, 7 to 8 p.m. Chime in with your questions on the chat. Tweet the show. We'll even have Collins. I can't wait to hear from you guys. This is going to be a lot of fun. So once again, it's our bleeping city. I am your host, Mikey Two Guns, every Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. See you soon, people. Alrighty, guys, welcome back to Palm Tree Sports. My name is Corey Pujols, your host, and as always, this is brought to you and powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Guys, for those of you who are listening, um, one of my good friends posted in the chat a very interesting update, so I'm going to go ahead and read it aloud. Just for those of you who don't have access, can't see the comments at the moment, if you're driving or something like that, I just want to get this out there because this is a bit of interesting information for those of you, especially if you if you follow volleyball. So last weekend was a tough weekend for the National Volley- uh, Volleyball Association, volleyball team, Florida, Southern Exposure, as they went 0-2 on the weekend. Guys, that's unfortunate because... 
you know, down here, we play a lot of volleyball. For those of you who do not know, we have beaches everywhere. And if there's one thing you're going to see on the beach, it's going to be a volleyball net, guys. All right. So there's a lot of volleyball down here. And this is kind of, uh, it's kind of saddening, you know, in, in real in real time perspective, just due to the fact that we pride ourselves on a lot of the outdoor sports, you would think that the hardest thing for us to do is to play hockey, right? Or something like that, when in actuality, it's the flip. It, it seems like we don't play well outside, but when it comes down to, to things on the inside, yeah, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> Miami made the finals. You know, like I said, the, the Bolts have been back to, they, they went to the Stanley Cup three straight years and had a run this past year before being knocked out. So guys, it's just something to take into consideration. However, they did lose to the Las Vegas Ramblers and the Inland Empire Matadors. The Southern Exposure were also eliminated from playoff contention as well, but they'll be back. As long as they don't destroy their current core and add to it, they'll be a force to be reckoned with next season. Thank you, Toronto. I appreciate it, brother. And that is just some information there that I uh, wanted to share, of course. I enjoy the fact that, you know, Toronto actually takes the time to go out and get us this information as well. It's something interesting for you to take in consideration, especially if you love volleyball. Uh, that is, you know, something that I will hopefully begin to incorporate into the show uh, once I, you know, get it worked out, get a slot for it, you know, more specifically. But, guys, that information is just there. Just you know, in case you're into that, you know, again, volleyball is something that we do a lot of down here, both in, in a pro, you know, fashion and a recreational fashion. I play volleyball. I like it. It's a fun sport, um, along with the rest of them. So there's that bit of information just in case you're looking forward to it. Now, as we continue to move on through the rest of the show, we have a little bit to talk about with the Rays. All right, guys. And this is, uh, I don't want to say, an existential thing because it's not, but here's hoping that the Rays are finding their footing back again after having this terrible slide of losing. All right, for those of you who do not know, the Rays open this season with a absolute tear of a win streak. I believe it was 22 in a row or something like that. It was absolutely nuts. All right, what the Rays were doing, looking like we assembled one of the greatest rosters in MLB history, and then boom, injuries. That is the detriment to all of our Florida teams. For those of you who are fans of Florida, you guys will know that every major team in Florida, when they experience success, is usually almost followed by some type of injury bug. It happened to the Bolts. It happened to the Rays. It happened to the Buccaneers. It happened to Miami. It happened to the Jaguars. It happens to all of us. It happened to Miami. Oh, my God. The the Heat, I mean, the Orlando Magic uh, a couple years back, it it was... (sighs) Everybody gets hurt when they come to Florida. <laughs> it's not just from the females, okay? It's not just from the females. It's from the sports perspective, too. So, the, the, but the girls down here break your heart, too. You guys ever heard that song, California Girl? Well, just double it. And that's what it's like here in Florida. So, in any case, that's neither here or there, guys. Realistically speaking, for the Rays, though, they are playing a doubleheader today, which they already wrapped up the first game with a win against the Kansas City Royals. Uh, that win took place in a 6-1, to one, uh, you know, demolishing of them earlier today. As I mentioned, I think that was around 1-something, 2. It was, it was earlier today. <clears throat> like I said, there's a two-game header. I believe the first game got shut down due to weather purposes. Uh, we are in the rainy season here for Florida. So for those of you who do not know, we are like just the weirdest state when it comes to, to, to weather. And what I mean by that is you'll start the day early in the morning. You get outside at 70. Okay, it's 70. Feels great, right? The sun starts peaking somewhere around 8.30, 9 o'clock. Then you start sweating a little bit. Then you get to 11, 12 o'clock. Now you're sweating a lot. You get to 2 o'clock and you're like, all right, uh, is it going to end? You get to 4 o'clock and it's just thunderstorms. And then, you know, either they last the rest of the night or they're spotty. And then you get sun and thunderstorm, sun and thunderstorm. I've seen lightning with the sun behind it. All right, guys, it's just a weird thing to witness. Like, let me tell you, seeing the sun out there, right, and then, you know, a giant cloud passes by, 10 minutes in, and boom, lightning. And you're just like, okay, but the sun's out. How? You, whatever. It's weird, dude. Have you guys ever seen the movie War of the Worlds? It's like the beginning of the movie where they, you know, the sun doesn't cause lightning. If you guys haven't seen it, go back and look at it. It was a great movie, tremendous movie, guys. But it's just an example of how funny it is down here. So... We get a lot of these double headers here. To say the least, that's the point. We get a lot of these double headers where a game gets canceled, gets pushed to the next day, or whatever the case may be. And as a result, that's what's going on here against Kansas City. So the second game will be played tonight at 7:10, about 20 minutes away, for those of you who are looking for some raised baseball. 
So that's the first bit of information. Now, the Royals are not by any means the hottest team, all right? They are sitting at 26 and 66. The Rays are the second hottest team in the league right now, sitting at 59 and 35. The only team that's doing better than the than the Rays right now are the Atlanta Braves, which, you know, it makes sense because they're playing tremendous right now. They're just playing absolutely tremendous baseball, even though the Rays are stacking up pretty good against them. So far this season, they're still playing tremendous baseball, and the Rays are hoping to get back on a winning slide of things instead of a losing slide, because I think it was seven straight, six straight, six or seven games straight that we lost before the All-Star break and getting that win against the Braves, ironically speaking, and that win was a very convincing win, a 10-4 win against the Braves in that last outing. Now, like I said, headed into the second game tonight at 10, or my bad, 7, 10 p.m., for those of you who want to watch, the third game of this three-game series is going to be played tomorrow at 2, 10 p.m., so we got tonight and tomorrow afternoon, early afternoon, if you're interested in it, that'll be what to look out for, so it's, again, tonight, 7, 10, tomorrow, 2, 10, wrap up this game series against the Kansas City Royals, hopefully the, the Rays can go ahead and just put three wins together right here, and that would put them tied with Atlanta for the best record, I believe it is. So we'll see how that goes in the meantime, between time. Now, just because the Braves aren't playing the best, uh, or the Rays, yeah, my bad, the Rays aren't playing or haven't been playing their best series, that doesn't mean the next team that, we've been pl- that we're going to play hasn't been. They have been. The next team that we play is the Texas Rangers, who are sitting at first in the AL West with a 53-39 and 39 record. All right, guys? So that is a big deal. All right? In order to build confidence, you have to play well at every stage in the game. But chief among them is playing well against the best teams. All right, it's a lot more respectable when the teams that you beat are relevant teams. All right, in other words, I'll give you an example. Last year, the Bucks made the playoffs with a seven and nine record. We lasted in the playoffs like we had a seven and nine record. We didn't go too far. Okay, that's the significance. Bigger games, bigger wins equals continuity. More continuity means more wins at the end of the day unless what you have going on is just not a well-oiled machine but what we have here in tampa bay is a well-oiled machine so we got to focus on playing good team ball we got to focus on winning those one-run ball games as i always complain about in every show ever all right guys and also we have to play to our strengths which means you know getting all of our playmakers on the bag or just hitting the ball well it's gonna be one or the other and let's not swing at jack okay what do you mean by let's not swing at jack guys you guys know just as well as i do The hallmark of a good pitcher is somebody that can get somebody to swing on dirt. He's throwing a terrible pitch and you're still swinging at it. Is that bad pitching or is that brilliant pitching? I would say it's brilliant pitching, okay? Because you got to have a good eye in baseball. Hand-eye coordination is chief among the skills needed to play this game. Let me tell you, I play a little baseball and, and I just so happen to have great reflexes. Thank God I do. Thank you, Dad. Get it from you. But... These players are very similar in that aspect, where their reflexes, their eyesight, their hand-eye coordination is absolutely second to none, and that's why they're playing good baseball, all right? So, Rays, let's go ahead, let's take off on these Rangers, let's assert ourselves again against against one of the other best teams in the league outside of Atlanta, again, who we just played in the series before this one, and like I said, that series is going to start Monday, July 17th at 8.05 p.m., so if you're looking what to, uh, looking for what to watch on Monday, or you have some free time, you're not going to be watching Monday Night Raw, which I am probably going to be watching both, so I'm just going to tell you I'm one of those guys, I flip, I go back and forth, I, it is what it is, I do it on the radio too, so if I'm listening to one station, like if I'm listening to the rock station, I'm not just listening to 107.3, I'm listening to 97.9 too, or 98 Rock, my apologies. So, and for those of you who do not know, 98 Rock is also the official radio station for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So, for any of you listening to 98 Rock, if you want to listen to some Buccaneers games, if you don't have access to watching it, there you go, 98 Rock, guys. So, that series, though, against the Rangers will be a nice, tough series for the Rays, especially after this series with Kansas City. Like I said, Kansas City sitting at 26 and 66 is not one of the best teams in the league. This is just a warm-up, I guess you could say. Hopefully, the Rays can get back into winning form, and that's what we're waiting to see, especially as we move on over into the series against the Rangers. Again, that will be Monday, July 17th at 8.05 p.m. is when it starts, so you know, get your Monday ready for that. Now, the last bit is going to, we're going to talk about the uh, home run derby, of course, the, the the break, the all-star break, in which Randy Rosarina competed, and he finished second in the home run derby. He lost to a good friend of his, so it's all good. You love to see it. You love to see the the uh, competition. You love to see the brotherhood. You love to see all of those good vibes that came from the weekend. It was a great series. Uh, I 
personally missed the first half of the home run series, but I did get to see a little bit more of the second half. And like I said, it was very entertaining. I love to see our boys, Randy Rosarina, did great. And I just look forward to seeing him being in that position again and hopefully bring home a W. Uh, I love to see him in his happy, you know, crossing the arms, you know, letting him know the business kind of deal. Brought his daughter out for a beautiful moment. And he had the boots out, too. For those of you who don't know, he had the boots out for the home run derby as well. So the guy was absolutely smashing it. We love Randy Rosarina down here. We hope he finishes his career down here in Tampa Bay. But he's a young guy. got plenty of time ahead of him. So hopefully, you know, he can help lead us to a ring, to a championship. Hopefully this season, guys. I look forward to seeing what happens the rest of the season with our Rays. As, like I said, we get back into the swing of things now that we have finished the All-Star break. So... Let's go ahead and move on over to what's going on tonight as far as what to watch. Now, I already gave you one thing, which would be the Rays game, which is starting at 7, 10 p.m. against the Kansas City Royals. But we also have pro wrestling and a UFC fight card tonight. So if that is more your style, if that is more what you're into, or if you like the physical side of things a little bit more than just the hand-eye coordination, here is what to look out for for AEW's collision card tonight, which brings another stat card as it's been since its release. Now, this is, I believe, the fourth week, the third or fourth week of AEW Collision, uh, George premiering on Saturday uh, Saturday nights at 8 p.m. The main event is going to be CM Punk versus Ricky Starts. This is the tournament final for the Owen Hart Cup tournament, guys. So for those of you who know who the Hart family is, the Hart Foundation, uh, if you will, the Canadian godfathers of wrestling, to say the least. Owen Hart was one of uh, one half of the Hart uh, brothers who there was, there was Owen Hart, there was... Uh, what's his name? The the best there was, the best there is, and the, the best there ever will be. Oh my gosh! What a time for me to, to to lose names right now, guys. If you can remember who I'm talking about, put him in, put his name into the chat. But he is the guy who perfected the sharpshooter. It was an absolute phenomenal time to be a, a wrestling fan if you got to see these guys. And of course, they won tag championships, they won singles championships. Owen Hart unfortunately lost his accident or lost his life in an accident, a wrestling accident during a live show where he fell from such a high uh, you know position that he was unable to recover due to his injuries so rest in peace to Owen Hart but this is the tournament series that is going on right now in AEW's main card for uh the main event I should say for collision tonight like I said is the final for the men's is CM Punk versus Ricky Starks I don't know who's gonna win this unfortunately I'm gonna have, probably gonna have to rock with CM Punk I don't think CM Punk truly and honestly deserves it if I'm being honest here I think due to some of the backstage antics that were you know caused during the Elite versus CM Punk saga is still not completely rectified and that at this time that he should be taking his time to really develop his in-ring ability back to what it used to be. He is only getting older and yes, he looks good for the, for the most part, but he's also dealt with a lot of injuries since his return. So these are just things to take into consideration. Ricky Starks is one of those guys who's just waiting for a push. He will be a world champion one day. The guy's character is absolutely contagious. He's phenomenal on the mic and I look forward to seeing what he's able to do. Also taking into consideration that he's been feuding with the Bullet Club recently so that is also something that could happen that the bullet club could interfere and if they were to do that i'm not exactly sure how it would go out my belief is that it's going to be cm punk pinning ricky starks even though i want ricky to win so we'll see what happens there go ricky cm punk i, I don't know i think you need a little bit more time in the ring before you start getting pushed again uh your name is humongous but it's not the only name in wrestling guys also we have ruby soho versus william nightgale on the female side of the tournament final for the owen hart cup this is going to be a great match. This is actually going to be a rematch as these two have fought before. I'm going to rock with Will and Night Willow Nightingale. I believe that it would do wonders for her career. But at the same time, I also feel that way for Ruby Soho, who happens to be a part of the most successful female franchise in AEW right now. In the outcast, Tony Storm is the champ. She is a two-time champ. And then you also have Soraya, who's back there. Also, another phenomenal female wrestler. So, guys, just take consideration this match. Could be a good match. Uh, if you're looking out to see how the females do, it's Ruby Soho versus Willow Nightingale. I'm going to rock with Willow Night Nightingale on this. Like I said, she's been on a tear. Her development has been phenomenal, especially fighting across three different stages of the wrestling company. She's been in IWGP. She's been in, in um, Ring of Honor. And then, obviously, she's here in AEW as well. Uh, Brett the Hitman Hart. Boom! That's the one. Good job, Dad. I appreciate that. That's exactly who we are talking about. Now... 
as I mentioned before, though, I'm going to rock with Willow Nightingale in the females final of the Owen Hart Cup tournament. And then also, guys, if you're looking for tag team action, we do have FTR taking on Bullet Club. This is going to be the best in three falls. The, these two teams have been feuding now for a few weeks. Uh, Bullet Club now with the addition of Jay White coming on from IWGP has been a form to reckon. I would not be surprised if FTR loses their tag titles in this uh, situation just due to the fact that obviously the gun club has been sitting back there helping out bullet club whenever something happens they have joined in force together ftr does not have much backup as some of their backup is actually wrestling again on the same night and in the main event it's cm punk so we will have to see what happens maybe ftr brings out a friend maybe they bring out somebody that can help them to be in their corner if not i see this somehow magically going to bullet club and we will have new tag team champions i don't know if this is going to be the best move but ftr by far is one of the best tag teams out there in all of pro wrestling so i would look forward to seeing a huge feud between these two which could help push them into the upper echelon of what's going on in tag team wrestling right now like i said definitely one of the best tag teams in all of wrestling at the moment so i look forward to seeing how this match goes this could be the best match on the card if we're being completely honest with you so be on the lookout for that now if you're not into pro wrestling and you prefer to watch uh, Mixed Martial Arts, The Real Deal, guess what? We got that for you tonight as well. There's a UFC fight night tonight where the preacher's daughter, Holly Holm, a crowd fav favorite, and the woman who dethroned Ronda Rousey will be fighting tonight against one young Myra Bueno Silva. All right, so guys, she is a young striker from Brazil with a with a, you know a lot of skills, guys, to say the least. Holly Holm is a seasoned veteran. She was a former boxer converted to Mixed Martial Artist, and we have seen her capture a world title. We've seen her rise above the antics of losing to younger fighters and be able to really put a decent record together holly holmes mma record is sitting at 15 and 6 while my uh myra's is sitting at 10 2 and 1 so this should be a phenomenal main event this is going to be the young lion versus the old lion in the women's bantamweight division i believe it is so let's look out for that main event guys uh this fight night is going to be a very young fight night with a lot of fighters less than 20 wins or 20 professional fights in their career uh the highest fight win percentage or win record for any fighter fighting tonight is going to be on the primary car seeing it with a 21 win uh, uh win record to a i believe it was four losses so guys the reason why I'm saying that is because this is an opportunity for you guys to see a lot of the young up-and-coming fighters, the guys you might not see on the main cards right now like we had just last week. By the way, if you didn't see last week's card, UFC 290, I believe it was, Volk versus Rodriguez, phenomenal. Very heartbroken at Robert Whitaker losing his title, or not title, but losing the fight um, last week against... Uh, Drake is Duplessis. I'm very disappointed in that. I'm even more disappointed in the fact that Brandon Moreno lost to Pantoja. However, unfortunately for them, this is just part of the fight game, guys. Congratulations to both of those fighters. I will go on record to say this. I do not like Drake is Duplessis. I believe his personality is terrible. When the champion confronted him in the octagon, he seemed a little lost for words, a little like, oh, I'm actually in the spotlight. Now I actually have to fight Izzy. Yes, you disrespected Izzy and his homeland and his heritage, even though you come from the exact same place. So I look forward to Izzy putting him in his place. I look forward to seeing this matchup go one-sided and Israel showing the world once again why he is one of the pound-for-pound pound best in the world and why he is possibly the greatest striker to ever grace a martial arts, let alone striking at all, background and platform. With that being said, uh, obviously Moreno versus Pantoja is probably they're going to have to run it back. Even though Pantoja has beaten Moreno three times now, that fight was one of the closest fights you'll ever see and there are some people who believe that Brandon won that fight. If you take away the wrestling or you nomify the wrestling with the overall striking of Brandon Moreno, Brandon's striking completely outpaced Pantoja's and he was also connecting a lot more, looked a lot more sure of himself in the pocket and you can tell Pantoja wrestled when he was getting his, his you know, teeth punched down his throat so i look forward to seeing that that rematch still team brandon love brandon moreno hope he's able to pull it out of the fire next time we'll see what happens there and in the main event volkanovsky did exactly what we expected him to do which was find a way a lot of people are making controversy over the headbutt but people have to understand that volkanovsky is a high level striker a high level grappler and high level brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner and when you're one of the best in the world you do everything correct which means ducking your head and leaning into your strikes why is that important it doesn't allow your opponent to counterpunch so for those of you who don't know anything about martial arts and you see one to fight or you 
are going to go back and look at the fight when you see that that head but i don't want you to put too much behind it also yair was awarded five minutes of recovery time which he chose not to utilize it he wanted to get back into the fight and that doing so so fast also helped lead to the finish volk is pound for pound the best fighter in the world right now there's no doubt about it his volume his ability his strengths his weaknesses that he's been able to master and the fact that he is such a short guy with such a long uh, reach and the dog inside of him is completely a match. There's nobody inside the UFC with a bigger dog inside than Volkanovski. So guys, that's just something else for you to look out for. Uh, reflecting from that last week's card over to this week's card, tonight is not a, a numbered card. What does that mean? It's just a fight night. Again, like I said, this is more of the chance to showcase what the UFC is all about with these new, young, up-and-coming fighters, these guys with a lot of promise who will one day be in the positions of Volkanovski and Rodriguez and Moreno and Pantoja and all these guys that we're looking at now in the numbered cards. So, if you are a fan of the young guys, both Jack Della Man, uh, Mandolina and Terrence McKinney, little T-Rex, are both fighting tonight. Guys, if you have not seen T-Rex fight, I'm telling you right now. And if you ever, if you hear this T-Rex, this is an homage. We've had a powwow on Twitter a couple of times, dude. I just want to say congratulations on your story. One of the best stories in all of martial arts. This is a guy who, you know, he wasn't sure if he was going to be alive. And now look at him. He's living his dream. He's doing everything that he thinks he can do and more. And the man also has a record for one of the fastest finishes two separate times over in mixed martial arts and UFC history, both at seven seconds. So go out, check this guy out. He is dynamite in a bottle. He finishes almost all his fights. If not, I think he's got a hundred percent finish rate inside the first round. So if you're looking for an exciting fighter, there are two fighters right there for you to check out. I'm like I said, very impartial to Terrence McKinney. And I look forward to seeing him put on a showcase tonight as I do with Jack and with Holly Holm. Guys, that's what's going on and what to look out for tonight. Like I said, you got baseball, you got pro wrestling, and you have mixed martial arts to check out tonight. There's a ton of drama going on elsewhere outside of just Florida in the sports world, so I encourage you to check out the rest of the shows that IE Sports Radio has to offer. Again, we cover a little bit of everything, and our aim is to get a little bit of everything covered here in the United States as far as every sport, every location. And per this location, Central and South Florida, well, pretty much all of Florida, my name is Corey Pools. I've been your host. I just want to leave you guys with some words of wisdom. Guys, enjoy the weekend. Take some time to rest. If you're busy, don't forget, God says, come to me and I will give you rest. You guys must rest. You must, you know, get some time alone with yourselves, some time to just recoup, get ready for what's coming up in the next week as we are facing different challenges. You know, I really hope you guys enjoyed the show. I hope you guys are enjoying time with your family. I hope you guys are eating well. I hope you guys are staying safe and protected out there. Don't let these politics and everything going on in the world drive you crazy. I'm saying that not just for you, but for me too. I struggle with it just like anybody else does. But I thank you so much for joining me here on Palm Tree Sports Radio. It's been my pleasure to talk to you about what's going on here in the Sunshine Sport or Sun Sunshine State. <laughs> Well, we talk all things sports, guys. If you guys want to holler at me, I'm on Twitter at Corey Pujols. Same thing with Instagram or Threads, which is new if you guys are on there. Type in my name. I'll pop up. There to talk anything sports related. I love it. I'm always there for it. And again, I look forward to being back here. Same time, same place, same show, same voice, guys. It's been Corey Pujols here from IE Sports Radio via Palm Tree Sports Radio. You know what it is. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Have a wonderful weekend, and I will catch you next week. Peace.